Hi, how are you? Hey, we're back, and uh, time to head back to the phones. Rush Limbaugh to Chicago. This is Bronson. Glad you called, sir. Welcome. Yes, sir. Thank you. So, um, a position that you've stated, as well as many other uh, voices on the conservative side, is this overall democratic strategy with regard to immigration. Yes. To be able to take care, uh, take advantage of voters that are undocumented, and you see this in the attacks on voter registration laws, on ID laws, and things of this nature. Um, the one question that I have specifically with regard to that, and, and really my only problem with that argument is, what is the end game? If we follow that through, then a few generations down the road, we've basically destroyed the United States if for no other reason than our incapacity to be able to assimilate that many people. So what I guess my question to you is, what, what do you think the end game is? Once they've gained control of power and they have this huge population of immigrants in the country. Have you that? have you heard of two people named Cloward Piven? No, sir. They are left wing social activists who have ties to New York's Columbia University. And they have been active in this very question. And they are advocating and it is part of the the whole uh Saul Alinsky community organizer movement, their desire is to destroy the United States as a capitalist entity by flooding it, by flooding the social welfare system with more dependents than can possibly be provided for to once and for all just blow up this country as founded and start over in creating a socialist paradise. Now, that's a bit extreme, but they're there, and they're real, and they are taught on many college campuses in both political science and sociology. There was a column in the, I think it was New York Times by a woman I have it here a couple days ago, it's time to give socialism a try. We haven't really given it a try, she says, and capitalism is responsible for all of the suffering in the world and all of the inequality in the world. What do you mean give socialism a try? We just spent eight years giving socialism a try, and maybe even more than that. But your question is a damn good question, and the answer to it is exactly what you said it is. You're, you, I used to ask myself this about Democrats, too. Why are they for tax increases? They're going to have to pay them, too. Why are the Democrats in favor of so much of what they're in favor of when it's going to destroy the foundation of the country as it exists? And you, if, if you can accept the fact that they are anti-capitalist, this Democrat Party today has nothing in common with the JFK Democrat Party or even the LBJ Democrat Party um, of the 60s and 70s. It is the radical left that has taken over this party. California is a great example of, of where the rest of the country could be. California is worried about having whatever open borders destroy the state. California is in the biggest financial mess it could be in. Uh, any state could be in, and it can't last for very much longer like this. There's got to have to be something that gives. The Democrat Party needs a permanent underclass of dependent people to continue to vote to prop Democrats up. And they need more and more of those as people escape lower levels of the middle class or poverty, become more self-reliant. Self-reliance is the biggest enemy the Democrat Party has. And they need to keep supplying the... Uh, uh, the country with a, a, a essentially a number of people every year that will equate to a permanent underclass that will constantly elect. That's why they're registering illegals with voters uh, with uh, uh, driver's license signups so forth. So, so they, they do want to eliminate the capitalist infrastructure of this country. OK, so for for the sake of conversation, let's assume that all of that is 100 percent complete, true and accurate. That's exactly what the plan is. How do you gain support for an idea like that? It seems to me that the last 200 years of American history easily proves the idiocy of that idea. Right. You don't tell people that's what you're doing. You tell them you're engaging in social justice for equality and fairness and to right all these previous injustices that began with the founding of the country from slavery forward. And you create the idea that what you're literally doing is establishing a utopia where there will be no judgmentalism and there will be no unhappiness and there will be no unfairness and there will be no inequality and there will be no um, uh, any of the things that upset people. 
Uh, and and you that's how you attract the young. It's working on college campus like a dream right now. The snowflake oh, movement is not even tolerate work. The snowflake movement on campus today treats words that they disagree with as weapons that they need to be defended against or from. Oh, absolutely. I just graduated college this year, and I, I can tell you from experience that's true. I had quite an interesting time wearing a Make America Great Again hat around. <laughs> It was very interesting. Oh, it does. I mean, but, but it's but the point is, they feel it's real. The, the 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 kids, the dupes, the 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 soldiers marching, and they are they're true believers. They're the useful idiots. They're the true believers. They they buy hook, line, and sinker that we are in the process of creating a utopia where all of this injustice and all of this. Un- what do you think a guaranteed national income is? It is a serious movement. There is a new economic theory being bandied about. I was just reading about it earlier this week, and it's it may be too much in depth for me to, to, to give it the fair exposition it deserves. But what it basically says is that since the government has a printing press, there really is no such thing as inflation. It doesn't really matter. And that we don't even need to raise taxes if we don't want to. We're going we're gonna to raise taxes and we're going to collect them. But the government doesn't need that to run the, 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 because they have a printing press and they can set the interest rates and do whatever they want. That they, It's impossible to have too much money flowing around. It's impossible to give too much money away. It is therefore fe- feasible and advisable to guarantee every American a $75,000 a year income. Don't have to work for it, not to do anything. How many people do you think would sign up for that? All of how many millions are signed up for it today? Well, exactly. For programs similar to. Exactly right. The, 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 the social welfare system in America, I, I'm someone that's taken advantage of it. When I first went to school, I was hell-bent. I will work. I will pay my way through college. And I did the math. I would have been working for 50 cents an hour if you count the benefits that I would have lost as income. Health insurance, things like that. When you have kids, it's non-negotiable. You have to have it. Yep. So then what, what do you do? And the thing that I discovered, I went, there were, gosh, at least three politicians I talked to were campaigning through Iowa for uh, various Senate and uh, House representative seats. And I basically asked them, give me 15 minutes to show you the research that I've done that proves that we're, we are holding people in poverty. Because from roughly twelve seventy five an hour up to $16 an hour, your standard of living goes down unless you can make the jump over $16 an hour. And it's because of the way these programs work and their cutoffs for them. They have hard cutoffs, say, for health insurance, $2,300 a month, family of four. If you make $2,301 a month, you all of a sudden lost all health insurance. If you make $1 less, then you have 100% paid for health care. Well, see, you, that's, that's you're, completely you're, nonsensical. You're, you're answering your own question. You drive the cost up of what you have convinced people they can't live without. You drive the cost up to where they can't afford it, and the only alternative is to have it provided by the government, and it's happening. The people in, 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 in involved in this really do not like this country as founded. That's what Obama was talking about when he said that he wanted to transform America. And the, the, uh, the original sin is slavery. The second original sin is the treatment of women. And there will never be any solution. It will never be resolved. It will never be permitted. It's going to be an ongoing sin that is never absolved. So there are constantly victims, a never-ending supply of victims. This is why so many people are, are fit to be tied about this, because they instinctively understand that, that, that a political party and movement in this country is actually not about improving things. It's about tearing things down. And I've asked myself, why would, why would you want to be in a party? Even if you have all the power in the world, why would you want to preside over a country that, as you call it, is basically third world? Well, don't forget, it'll be third world for the vast majority, but not for the elites. In their way of thinking, remember now, is what we're talking about. In their way of thinking, they're going to be in charge of everything. They'll be able to insulate themselves from all of this 
misery, pain, suffering, and so forth. The desire for power, control of other people, which includes the elimination of opposition, is an aphrodisiac that these people simply can't resist. I want to read something to you here. From, I, I prepared a little analysis of this. There's no reason money needs to be counted anymore. There's no reason that we need to even worry about how much money we print, this new movement of monetary policy. Warren Moser, Mosler is, is uh, one of the people quoted in this. It's a 19-page story, which is why I can't do a full exposition of it. He says, I look at things at an elemental level. He got down in the weeds to examine precisely how the Fed Reserve and the Treasury interacted with the general economy. He wanted to understand what happened to balance sheets when the Treasury collected taxes, traded bonds, spent and created money. And he came to believe that the conventional wisdom has the relationship between government and the private sector ass backwards. Most of us assume government has to tax before it spends. That like you and me, we have to earn money before we can buy anything. If government wants to spend more than it taxes, and it almost always does, then we think that it has to borrow from the bond market. But by examining the granular way government accounts for its spending, Warren Mosler saw that in every case, the government spent money long before they ever taxed it. Expenditures come first. When your Social Security check is due, the Treasury doesn't look to see if they have the money. They just cut you the check. It simply keystrokes the money directly into your bank account. It debits itself simultaneously, creating the money it pays you out of thin air. When you pay your taxes, the same process happens in reverse. The federal government subtracts dollars from your account and eliminates the same amount from the liability side of its ledger effectively destroying the money you just paid it. Unlike households or firms or even state and local governments, the federal government is authorized to create dollars. It adds money into the economy when it spends it, and it takes it out of the economy when it taxes it. There's nothing to prevent the federal government from creating as much money as it wants and paying it to whoever it wants. And that was Alan Greenspan in 2005. And there are people saying this is the way things ought to be running. This idea that we have to have a certain level of taxation and, and that depends on what we can spend is silly. We should spend and spend and spend and spend and tax whatever we can collect and everything will work out. So there's a big movement on for absolutely no limits on government spending. Despite what they see in Greece, despite what they're seeing in the European Union, where they can print money too. It is the most incredulous thing. And this is a serious monetary theory that is effervescing and percolating out there among some of the brightest minds of economics. Because they think the current balance sheet system is an utter failure. The national debt thus will mean nothing. The annual budget deficit will mean nothing because all money is Washington's. And what you have is what government decides to let you have, not what you're earning. So why flood the country with people who can't work or can't produce and earn a lot? Why, why flood the country with people that can't read? Why flood the country with people who can't speak English and are not going to learn? Why flood the country with people who are not even interested in becoming Americans? The answer to all these questions is found in everything liberals believe. And we'll be back. Sit tight. The last caller had a really great question. Why would the Democrats want to preside over a country that's not great like that? Folks, the Democrats do not believe in America being great. They resent that. The, the idea that we're better or exceptional or great, they hate that. We, we don't deserve our superpower status or greatness because of the way we've treated people around the world. Go wear a Trump hat next to a, a commie bastard liberal. See what happens to you. And he also said, well, how do, how do, you, how do you gain support for these ideas? You don't gain support for ideas and liberalism. You force people to do things. You propagandize them. You indoctrinate them. Or you make them. You don't gain support for anything. They can't gain support for these ideas. You have to brainwash people, promise them utopia or whatever. But there's no gaining support. Liberalism is not democratic. 
It's authoritarian, top to bottom. Like third world countries where they just accept that a few have pretty much everything and the rest of the population is peasants trying to escape. Anyway, that was a great question. I really appreciate that guy calling. Made the host look fabulous, don't you agree?